Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and start setting up for our next didactic about meeting the research rainmakers. Um, the four program officers who we're going to be meeting, if you don't mind coming up here and grabbing a seat. Oh yeah, we can go ahead and get you all up there. I think that um, some people have slides, so we'll just kind of go through, yeah, yeah. This is the order I have folks in, but feel free to sit in whichever order you like. And we'll, this is the order I think that we have the slides, probably. Do you want to hold this here? That would be great, I think, because we'll do brief intros with the program officers and then open up to questions. So if you don't mind all sitting up there, that would be great. I think we're also, I think I saw, yeah, and I definitely saw um, Dr. Korn. Yeah, let's see if there's any out there. We'll give them just another minute to work their way in. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, if anybody in the back doesn't mind checking if there's anybody waiting for to join the session in the chairs, do you mind just taking a quick peek? He looks distinguished, and I think he has glasses. <laughs> Um, actually, just a plug while we're here. Um, so this is a series of events. We have this didactic first to kind of introduce our program officers, ask some questions. Um, we have some one-on-one -on -one interviews that we booked for the next hour and a half afterwards. But then we would love to have you all come and join the meet and greet, um, where we're going to have our program officers and a lot of other interested researchers. And that's going to be in this same room um, starting at 4.30, from 4.30 to 5.20. And there's going to be a big spread, so come back for that. All right, I think Dr. Wang and Dr. Korn, we have seats for you up here. All right. Um, so my name is Yo-Yo Duamum, one of the um, assistant professors at Stanford. And then um, Bernard Chang is back there. Um, he is uh, one of the research directors at Columbia. Um, and so us and Jody, we are the ones who put together this um, didactic. But it is all about the program officers. So we're going to let them do most of the talking. Um, we have four program officers here um, from all across NIH. What we're going to do is basically let them all speak for about five to six minutes um, about their um, institute and also just talk a little bit about what program officers do and what they want you to know. And then we're going to open it up um, and ask questions for the rest of the session. So I'm just going to give very, very brief um, introductions in terms of where everybody is from. And so we have Dr. Wang here from NHLBI. Um, we have Dr. Lee from NIAD. Um, we have Dr. Uh, Huntley from NIDA. And we have Dr. Korn from NINDS. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and I think we have slides for several folks up here. Um, let's see. We'll go. And then it's up to you if you want to stay where you are if you want to come up here. But if you want, yeah, we have a advancer right here. All right, thank you. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. This is, uh, I don't know how many years I've done this, but uh, it's always a joy to come to SAM and, and give a presentation on NHLBI. So uh, as you heard earlier, my name is Wang Wang. I'm the director of the Office of Research Training and Career Development at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And so let me start by just going over the mission of my institute, and that is to provide global leadership for research, training, and education programs to promote the prevention and treatment of heart, lung, blood diseases. Um, in terms of the research, I mean, we have really no preference. We, we support research from basic clinical, translational, implementation science. Uh, we support R1 uh, investigator-initiated projects, single-site, multi-site uh, clinical trials, you name it. Uh, as long as it's related to HLPS, we're interested. Now, for training, which is uh, you know, my area for what I do at the NHLBI, um, you know, we are, I believe, the fourth largest IC among NIH. There are 27 different ICs, uh, institutes, and centers. Uh, by budget, I think we're the fourth largest with a budget of around $3.4 um, A lot of that is actually devoted to training. So we have really high priority for training the next generation of heart, lung, blood, and sleep researchers. And just to give you some, some idea of what I'm talking about, um, some of you here are obviously are for individual K awards. NHLBI supports almost 900 individual K awards at any given time. And uh, that, that's a budget of about 140 to $150 million. So it's quite a, quite a big investment. That's just for individual case. We have another $100 million set aside for T32s, which I'll mention very briefly uh, in one of my next slides. But you can see we, we have a pretty big commitment to supporting uh, research training. And so here's the strategic plan for NHLBI. This is uh, something I'm going to show you now, but it's actually in the process of being refreshed. Um, this was developed five years ago. We actually uh, published a request for information RFI at the end of last year to gather input from the extramural community to help guide us in terms of what our priorities should be in the next five years. So this is actually going to be a little bit different when you see it in a few months when we do release it. Uh, but I did want to just highlight, since this is still the, the current uh, strategic objective that we have, some of the things that I think are, are relevant to emergency medicine. Um, so we have four overarching goals. Obviously, the one I've highlighted in red, workforce development, is the one that I'm most interested in. Uh, but I think some of the ones objectives, so these are the four broad overarching goals. We have eight strategic objectives that align to these goals. Um, and I think some of these are relevant to, to some of the work that you're doing, and I'll just highlight a few of them, such as number five, develop and optimize novel diagnostic and therapeutic strategies to prevent, treat, and cure HOBS diseases. Uh, objective six, optimize clinical implementation research to improve health and reduce disease. And another one that's really, really big right now is leveraging emerging opportunities in data science. I don't know how many of you are involved in data science or large um, uh, data sets. But we've invested quite heavily at NHLBI in uh, data resources. So, so some of you may have heard of PopMed or Biodata Catalyst. I can just tell you right now, if you put any of those things into your grant, it instantly becomes a high priority for us. Um, so data science is something that's, that's really, really a, a hot area for us. So a while back, uh, NHLBI supported uh, a decade of K-12 programs. Um, so these are institutional K awards. Those programs have sunset now, but uh, you know, that was really, really important in terms of developing a critical mass of emergency care researchers to really kind of carry the mantle and move it forward in terms of more researchers, more uh, mentors. And so we've primarily focused our attention on more sustainable training mechanisms. This includes the institutional T32s as well as the individual uh, K awards. And I'm happy to talk, I'm not gonna talk about any of these specifically, but anybody has questions, I'm happy to answer any questions you have about any of those. Uh, but those K-12 programs that I mentioned, uh, that was actually spearheaded by Jane Scott, and I don't know Jerry Brown, I saw Jeremy Brown outside, but he, he was also heavily involved in those K-12 programs. Um, but we invested uh, about $25 million, so, so I think uh, it's safe to say that, uh, you know, that investment was something that we want to continue moving forward. So, so certainly uh, that's why I'm here, and, and certainly look forward to working with uh, more in the emergency medicine field. And so what are some of the T32s that we're supporting? I just want to highlight some of the ones uh, that we currently fund. Um, these are programs, three of these actually are from the original K-12 programs. So these are led by the individuals who led those K-12s. So we have a program at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, we have one at the Icon School of Medicine by Lynn Richardson. We have a relatively new one in uh, resuscitation science. Uh, this was uh, launched about two years ago at Beth Israel. This one's led by Michael Danino. And our most recent one is from Vanderbilt. So this is a program led by Michael Ward um, and Alan Storrow there. Uh, so this was actually just funded a, a few months ago. So if anybody's interested in T32s, uh, we are very, very interested. So please reach out, uh, don't hesitate, because we're always looking to support more programs in emergency care research. 
And what about the individual K awards? So I just did a, a quick rundown to see uh, how many K awards we have from PIs who are affiliated with emergency medicine departments. So these are the last five years. Uh, you can see in blue, these are the number of applications that we received, and green represents the number of applications that we have funded. So it's not a huge number, considering we have 900 individual Ks, uh, but certainly you know, we, we hope that these numbers sort of will, will, go, will continue to increase. Um, so we have about 75 applications in emergency medicine over the course of the last five years, and we were funding about a third of those. Um, and I will say 2024 is not over. Um, it's not much, but we are actually going to be picking up a few more uh, emergency medicine applications uh, in FY24 since we have one more count around to go through before the end of the fiscal year. And so these are just examples of uh, some of the Ks that we are currently funding. I'm not going to read all of these, um, but I did want to just uh, underline why these are of interest to us for obvious reasons. Uh, cardiac arrest, uh, heart failure, hypertension, coagulopathies, uh, respiratory distress, uh, so on and so forth. So these obviously align with NHLBI. But if your research isn't as clear-cut as these in terms of you know, which IC uh, you should send your application to, I just want to very quickly mention, many of you probably already know this, so I won't go into detail on it, but NIH Reporter is a great resource to see all the funded projects by NIH. This is a congressionally mandated website. We have to show where uh, your tax dollars are, are going. So that's a great way uh, to, to look at what's uh, currently being funded. Also, Matchmaker, um, that's a great way. If you don't know where to start and your research might align with different ICs, you can actually just put in your specific aims, and it'll tell you which ICs are funding research similar to what you're doing. The nice thing about Matchmaker is you can actually look at the individual grants, and there's a link that you can contact the program officer that is actually overseeing those individual awards. So it's a great starting point if you don't know where to go. And of course, you know, the reason we're here is to make things even easier than that. Here's my email um, and, and the emails of all the other members of my office. Please don't hesitate to ever reach out to, uh, if you have any questions about training awards. My office only handles training grants, so K's, T's, and F's. But, uh, you know, I, I know based on the one-on-one -on -one sessions that we have uh, after this one, many of you are interested in, in R01s. Um, you can certainly still reach out to us if we can't help you. It's probably easier, easier for us to point you to the right person if you're interested in R01 funding. The last thing I will just note, uh, those of you who are, are aware, we have a loan repayment program. I didn't have time to cover it today, but uh, if you have any student debt and uh, you'd like to erase some of that student debt, we do have programs to help support that. And so the two Karens in my office, Karen Lidman and Karen Nielsen, would be the people to talk to. Feel free to just email them to get more information on that. So with that, I will stop and thanks for your time. Thank you. And um, as a reminder, if anybody's looking for these slides, they are available on the app. So if you want to access all those email addresses. All right, Dr. Huntley, would you like to come up here as well? Or? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kristen Huntley. I work in the Center for the Clinical Trials Network at the National Institute on Drug Abuse. NIDA is the lead federal agency supporting research on drug use and its consequences. Our mission is to advance science on drug use and addiction and to apply that knowledge to improve individual and public health. I refer you to our current strategic plan, which provides a lot of detail and outlines our, our current research priorities. Um, this is a, a living document and has lots of information about both thematic areas and overarching priorities for NIDA. NIDA and many institutes and centers at NIH have been um, very busy in recent years supporting research to address the overdose epidemic in the U.S., and we have had additional funding from Congress to support the Helping to End Addiction Long-Term Initiative, or HEAL. This is an NIH effort led by Drs. Volkow and Koroshetz at NIDA and NINDS to speed scientific solutions to, to end the crisis. Since 2018, over 1,800 research projects in all 50 states, totaling over $3 billion, have been supported. 
This has entailed collaboration across 18 NIH institutes and centers and over 40 FDA approvals for investigational new drugs or devices have uh, resulted from this funding. Also, 300 plus clinical trials are underway, and there are active partnerships with communities, federal, state, and local agencies, private sector entities, and academia. Some of the NIDA flagship programs are shown on this slide. Expansion of the NIDA Clinical Trials Network is one of the HEAL-funded activities NIDA has supported. The CTN uh, has the mission of supporting multi-site clinical trials to look at effectiveness of different treatments and prevention strategies to address substance use disorders. The JCOIN initiative, or the Justice Community Opioid Innovation Network, is supporting research to build evidence for OUD treatment in justice populations. And the Healing Communities Study has implemented evidence-based prevention and treatment interventions in 67 communities in four states. And results from this study should be published um, shortly. Uh, the goal of this project was to reduce opioid-related overdose deaths by 40%. These are just three of many, many programs that NIH is supporting through HEAL. It has been an unprecedented opportunity to support additional research to address pain, pain management, and substance use disorders. Then, and I'll speak a little bit about the NIDA Clinical Trials Network um, since I work in that office, but also um, this is a platform that is great for early stage investigators. It provides a lot of opportunity for um, early stage investigators to get involved in research, to collaborate on research or serve as site PIs. The CTN is comprised of 16 nodes, or main sites, across the U.S., and each node is affiliated with numerous clinical and research sites, including primary care practices, emergency departments, specialty addiction treatment centers, et cetera. And our director likes to say that the CTN is an open network. Any investigator can collaborate with a node PI or co-investigator to develop research concepts and submit them to our research development committee for consideration. The network is supported by a clinical coordinating center and a data and statistics center, and we also have a dissemination initiative. This slide lists some of the recent and ongoing research conducted through CTN. I, I'm not gonna read through this. I'll just highlight one example. Um, the, the CTN 99, or ED Innovation, is a very large trial which implemented buprenorphine programs in 29 emergency departments and is studying um, a daily sublingual buprenorphine formulation compared to a weekly injection looking at engagement and treatment as the primary outcome. Uh, emergency medicine research is a very high priority for NIDA and the CTN. This slide lists some other projects that NIDA is supporting. The CTN research is just a small part of what NIDA supports in this space. I'm, you'll be relieved to hear I'm not going to read through each and every one of these studies. Um, this is just shown to illustrate the range of research that NIDA supports in emergency medicine settings, ranging from projects looking at natural language processing uh, to, for overdose surveillance to studying ketamine for the treatment of OUD and suicidal ideation as examples. I refer you to our website for specific funding opportunities for the RFAs that are out on the street, program announcements, and notices of special interest. Um, I wish I had more than five or six minutes to talk about this. I'll just say um, 
top priorities right now for NIDA include, uh, but are not limited to, developing therapeutics for polysubstance use, addressing comorbidities and substance use disorders, and this is not just infectious disease co comorbidities, mental health comorbidities are of the utmost importance to address um, in, in uh, the context of substance use disorders as well. Health equity is another high priority area, as is data science. I think for every institute and other um, agency, this is a, a top research priority at this time. I'll close by uh, just giving a shout out to our dissemination resources that have been developed. Um, our extramural researchers have been terrific about developing resources to bring the research to clinicians. And this slide, uh, which is available in your app, highlights some of them. Um, the Yale School of Medicine website has great resources, NIDA's website, California Bridge has great resource resources, and ASEP has been a terrific partner. Uh, they've developed, they, in collaboration with researchers, have developed the Equal Network Opioid Initiative and their Pain and Addiction Care and EDs accreditation program. CMS quality improvement organizations also have resources and technical assistance available. And also a shout out to our NIDA um, mentored award program. We collaborate with professional associations on uh, this program to award small awards for dissemination projects. Uh, and this is one of our recent resources. I'll stop there, trying to keep within the six minutes. Uh, look forward to any questions afterward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Lee. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for organizers inviting me to talk representing NIAID. We typically call ourselves NIAID, which stands for National Institute of Allergy Infectious Diseases. Um, NIAID is the second largest funding institute within NIH. We have uh, 6.3 billion last year. And this year, we, our budget kept flat, so that's really a big relief for us. There was a period of time we heard we're going to get a 23% cut. So the mission of NIAID, obviously, are twofold. Number one, are infectious disease. Number two, are immunology-related disease, and we call IID, meaning immunology and infectious disease. We also have a mandate, a congressional mandate for biodefense that used to be a big chunk of our NIAID budget. Um, so who we are, and I am acting deputy director of Office Research Training and Special Programs, and we are right here. You see the circle. So with 6.3 billion budget, NIAID is, is quite a big. So we have three, four major divisions under the director office, including the DATES division, which um, uh, fund most applications for AIDS-related applications and contract. As well, we have DIMIT, or Division of Microbiology Infectious Disease, and then DATE, D-A-I-T, which is for allergy immunology. And then we have Division of Extramural Activities, that's my division, and my office is the only program office in that division uh, managing uh, three major parts. Number one is research training. Those are mostly uh, pretty much everything about fellowships, career development awards, and the training, including T32 or T35s. We also manage SBAR, STTR grants, and we also manage some international programs. So our budget overall is a bit over $300 million compared to the whole budget. It's not huge, but it's decent. Uh, what we do, as I already said, basically we're managing the research training, we are managing SBARs, TTR, loan repayment, 
and uh, as well as international auditing and also training, administrative training for infrastructure building of foreign applicants, particularly in those lower middle income countries. This is our budget, so we are glad to report our budget has been steadily increasing. This is only for research training, meaning the budget for the F's, K's, and the T's, not including others. And in the FY23, we increased 131, which we are not still not happy about it. We're working with our new institute leader after Tony retired and uh, Dr. Ginny Marazzo. We are glad to hear her. She put as training, research training and cultivating next generation investigators as her top priority. So we, we are so glad to hear that. We hope we'll continue steadily increasing. And you can also know the percentage of, we pretty much put a lot of money on T's and that is bigger grants and is highly respected for all the institutions anyway. But our intention I want to share with everyone, we would like to increase or shift a little bit to fellowships and career grants in the future. So stay tuned for, for other news. This is kind of a mechanism my office support, and we, we really want to have a continuum ever since, starting from as early as K-12 program. Those are supported even for the um, elementary school mentoring and the teaching all the way to the independent R01. So I'm not going to go over each, and we put into two tracks. One, we call it health professional track. Typically, um, you have clinical uh, degrees, and also for basic research track as well. And of course, we manage LRPs as well as diversity supplement, and we are committed to supporting a diversity of workforce as well. Um, this is another summary. I'm glad the slides will be shared so I don't need to go through everything. Once again, we try to categorize based on career track of junior faculties. Go ahead and take a look and see which one may, you may feel like you fit the best. And always, as everybody talk about, reach out to our program officer for more discussions. And I will share our resource page as well as contact information after uh, this presentation. Um, I want to add a few things. Recently, we did very intensive portfolio analysis, and we feel like we need to rebalance the portfolio a little bit. Number one, from my perspective, we want to expand the training budget, but that's always tough anyway. So the other part, we were asked to balance the portfolio. So we recently, just last week, we published five notices. Number one, we increased the salary for several cases, including K01, K25, and K99. And number two, this is shows our commitment for sure. Number two, we also increased this, um, the research support. And number three, now we increased K99 from past two years for the R00 phase to three years, which we've been hearing that quite a bit, and we are very successful to get K99 uh, applications. So I want to add right here, we invite you to submit K08, K23, as well as we have two physician K99 R00 uh, no, no foes, we call them. Please submit because we feel we are seeing decreasing trending of K08, K23, and physician K99. And here, for anybody who are interested in that kind of a, a funding mechanism, we welcome you, um, you might you to submit applications. And we can talk a little more if you have more interest. And of course, we are trying to make sure K24 only for the middle career. And in the past, we had supported for professors, particularly when they got the grant awards in when they were associate professor, and, and then they promoted, and we allowed them to continue. And the reason we continue to support this because this is a, a mentoring for K23 awardees, so we would like to continue to support K20, uh, K24 as well. And those are for associate professor right now. And they have to mentor uh, K23 awardees and continue uh, to do POR research. And for T32, we are almost 50% budget committed to T32, which obviously is our commitment. And we are also 
would like to really to balance the whole portfolio. So recently we decided we are going to cap slots at eight slots per training grant. And we're glad we've been supporting numerous uh, highly prestigious uh, uh, T32 awards. But we think we need to expand this. That's the number one. And also we need to make sure we have new application successfully awarded as well. And we are not going to participate in T35. Most reason because we don't have to see any many uh, applications anyway. With that, there are multiple resources out there, so you can click and just check and make sure you reach out to this particular email. This is the email will send to everybody in my office, as well as all the program officers in the NIAID who are assigned. We call them training officers. That means training POs, program officers, meaning their portfolio, including um, Fs, Ks, or Ts, and LRPs and others. With that, I'm adjourning my, my presentation. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The left corner is going to turn it over to you. You did not have I do not slides. All right, they were not required. Yeah, they were not required. <laughs> and that always gets me up here last. Um, which is a good thing. Um, so the first thing I'll say, first hello. Um, the next thing I'll say is what they said. Um, we all have the same alphabet soup of funding mechanisms. We, we don't use all of them. They don't use everything we use. We don't use everything they use. Um, the good news, some people don't like that, but the good news about it is each institute has its own approach to doing things, and nobody really knows what's going to work. And it's all hypothesis testing. And what we do is we all have our own notions of what the community needs and how to do it. And we have different approaches to doing it. And then we look very carefully at outcomes to see whether they work or not. Um, and as an example of that, um, oh, and let me just say, um, um, we, in fact, have not seen a downturn in K08 and K23 applications. We've seen an upturn, which is a little bit different from the rest of NIH. Um, not a big number in terms of up, but, but real. And we place an enormous influence on supporting clinician scientists. It is a tiny part of our training portfolio, or our whole portfolio, and we put an outsized effort and amount of resources into them, recognizing the need to support clinician scientists and the difficulty of clinician scientists succeeding. Um, the, I want to focus on what we are doing specifically. So this is actually my first time at this meeting, and I'm very glad to be here. Um, the, so NHLBI had the K-12, as Wayne mentioned. They had it for 10 years, and theirs was a standard institutional K-12 where an, an institution gets a grant with a certain number of slots, and the goal is you fund a certain number of people, and those people go on to be successful, and you've added some number of people to the workforce. And that program was very successful, and they sunset it on purpose, and that was all by design. We took over the K-12 business for emergency medicine, and we do it a little bit differently. And so we started a K-12, and I will say a downside to it right now is that it is very neurospecific, so NINDS runs it. Um, NIDA has signed on to it. NIA has signed on to it. Other institutes have not. And so what that means, for example, is if you're a neuro studying a mental health disorder, you're not going to get funded by it um, because mental health didn't sign on to it. Whereas if you're doing a drug abuse, NIDA may choose to fund it. Um, it's, but it's focused on neurological disorders. Um, and so I'll just put in a plug. I've mentioned this at other places. Um, the powers that be in emergency medicine could contact their institute of choice 
in their field and say, why aren't you participating? And this doesn't have to be a neurocentric K-12. It just is because of the number of institutes that signed on to it. Other institutes could decide to sign on and it would grow. So let me tell you a little bit about it. It's a national program and it's partly designed to be like the institutional K-12, whereas it supports a certain number of scholars for a certain amount of time and a certain amount of money and all of that. And the goal is for those scholars to be successful in, in going on to getting research funding and launching a career. And a big difference between a national and an institutional program is that the institutional program is picking from among the people at the institution or people they can recruit to their institution. The national program is picking from every institution in the country. And there's this big central committee running the program. Central committee means a PI and a committee that the, the principal investigator put together, or in this case, there are four principal investigators. Um, and it's an oversight and selection and mentoring and soup to nuts group of people that are running the program. And they represent, even though there's a PI at an institution, they are representing the emergency medicine community. And our message to them is, here's a bunch of money, make it work. And if you make it work, the money flows. And if you don't make it work, the money stops. And, but they're selecting from the entire country. And it turns out, so this is the third one we've launched. We have one in neurosurgery. We have one in pediatric neurology. They've, they're both very successful. And this one will be equally successful. I would bet my house on it. Um, it turns out, done right, it's not that hard to pick three new people in the country every single year and have them successfully go on to launch their careers. And so that's just part of the problem, program. Another part of the program is you've got all of these applicants that are not going to get funded by the program. And these, this central committee is charged with helping all the applicants that you don't fund go on to launch successful careers. And it turns out it's successful at being that because it's this big central mentoring advisory group that puts in components to help everybody. And then a third aspect of this program, which is asking a lot, and don't tell NIH Central that I'm saying this, you're all sworn to secrecy, because they would hate it. But a, a third component of this is that since there are so many senior people involved in running these programs and in mentorship, that it actually kind of juices the entire community to say, well, wait a minute, I can apply for a grant. And lo and behold, what any of us will tell you is the surest way to get funded is to actually apply for a grant. And when people apply for grants, they get funded. And so the idea behind this national program is not only to have three new people per year successfully launch careers, but to add the applicants and somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 50% of those based on other experiences are going to successfully launch careers, even though they weren't funded by this program. And the community at large is going to grow as a consequence of this. And so this is a major effort on our part um, to try to grow not only piece by piece, but to get the entire community to buy in to growing research in emergency medicine. Um, we'll see how it goes. It's just starting. The first application date for people is in in October of this year. Um, you have to be a first or second year faculty member to apply. Um, I recommend everybody at any career stage to find out about it and get involved. And I'll just say one more thing and then stop talking. Um, there's also, there's been a lot of discussion. How many, how many people in this room are pre-faculty? 
a few. Um, regardless, I'm just curious. There's been a lot of discussion the last couple of days about supporting residents and fellows in research. Um, we have a program designed to support residents and fellows in emergency medicine. It's run out of neurology and neurosurgery, but emergency medicine has always been an intended target. It has not taken us up on it, and we know the reasons, and we're working on changing that. There are other NIH programs that I actually don't know whether these three institutes are involved. There's an R38. There are other R25s. There are a number of programs for residents and fellows in emergency medicine. And as all of them said, you need to become aware of these things and look at websites. The websites aren't that bad. Everybody complains about NIH websites. Some are better than others. Um, you actually just have to spend a little time and figure out how to navigate them. Um, there's a lot of information there. But there are programs to support residents and, and fellows um, at all of NIH. Um, so take a look. Get involved. Get in touch. Always feel free to get in touch with us. The training programs are a great place to start. We kind of like hearing from people. Um, it's the fun part of the job. And we, if we are not the right people to talk to, we will get you to the right people to talk to. So with that, I'll stop and we can open it up. Questions for any of our program officers? We'll open it up. We have another 10 minutes, and then we're in this room for the next session, too, so we could also run it a little bit longer. Yeah, we'll be running it over. about trying to develop, develop a mentorship plan or a, for your mentees, but and also there is this aspect of an individual new research plan with building on your existing funding portfolio. What has your, your sense been in terms of trying to find that balance of focusing a K24 on developing your mentorship skills for mentees and that um, kind of new research twist on your existing portfolio? Great question. I can start because I, I probably was one specifically mentioned K24. So K24 requires you have already have R01 support funded already. So in the in the application, there's no need to talk about your research too much because the peer reviewer will be instructed to not evaluate the research part. So focus on the mentoring part. Why? How you successful in terms of doing POR yourself through the career, as well as what's your plan to mentor to get K23 awardee. If you already mentored some of K awardees, K23 awardees, chances are it will be very good for a successful K24. Does that re address your question? cost extension. Uh, we've run that quite a few times lately. So if you're going to no cost extension, it, yeah, in your R1, in your parent award, you are not eligible for the K24. It has to be active support. Thanks. Any other questions? We have our mic there that's floating around. I think there's one question in the back. What was the question? I'm going to pitch that question to um, the director of the Office of Emergency Medicine at NIH. <laughs> well, uh, the short answer is no, and the longer answer is absolutely no. Um, here's, the, here's, I'm gonna, here's the issue. NIH is set up by Congress in 
And the congressional languages, there are 27 institutes and centers of the NIH. If you want a 28th, then you have to do one of two things. You have to remove one of the existing centers, because by law there can only be 27, or you have to get Congress to approve the funding of a new institute. Good luck with that. Um, the NIH budget this year is mostly flat, uh, if not down in, in some significant places. So this isn't a question of what, what, the, what the NIH wants to do. The NIH can't tomorrow say, we're creating another. It has to come from Congress. So if you want there to be an office, uh, a center for emergency care research, then get Congress to do it. It's as, it's as easy as that. It's as easy as that. I just want to give a different answer. Um, and Bob Newmar this morning gave a good statement for any of you who saw his talk as to why you actually don't want this. Um, and I think it's a pretty obvious thing that you don't want this. Um, if you are doing biomedical research, then there is an NIH institute that is responsible for supporting your research. They may choose not to, or you may not get funded, but there is no lack of institute support for anything that anybody in this room is doing. And what this does is it allows you to go and, and target your research to the institute that wants to support your research. If you had an institute of your own with its own budget that would actually probably reduce the success rate for people because they'd have a limited budget and it's all going to emergency medicine, right? And so you're far better off being able to go to 27 institutes than going to one. Well stated, I was going to say that much less eloquently. And sorry to put you on the spot, Jeremy, but that was really useful. It's very interesting to me that only institutes with money say you really don't want an institute. And I, I get what you're saying. So if this is all hypothetical anyway. I get what you're saying, that you go to one school. I, I challenge uh, any other of the existing institutes to turn around and say, you know what? It's much better off. We don't need all the neurologists coming to neurology, to NIMDS. Let them go. There's a bit of neurology in general medicine. There's a bit of neurology in cancer research. And there's a bit of neurology in... We would never do that. We would never do that. So I'm going to respectfully disagree. It doesn't matter because it's not going to happen. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if an institute is well funded... Uh, you know, NIMDS began the 1930s. It was the communication. It was N I C yeah, something something. Yeah, communication and the joint together. You know, every single institute begins with Congress saying we're going to we're going to fund this institute with a block of money, and um, that, 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 again, that's how it goes. Uh, so, for now, I, but I think uh, Steve is onto something. There's often been a call for a special emergency medicine uh, study set be organized by the Center for Scientific Review. And I think, you know, riffing off what Steve says, that, that's not, right now, that's not a good idea. Number one, there aren't enough applications. You need about 50, I believe, to get a study section set up. 50. And number two, those would literally be competing against each other. The bottom half would not get discussed automatically. Uh, and the top half, you know, there would be, they would be competing for the best score because that's just sort of what's on in the reviewer's mind. So, um, one, of the, one of the things that I wanted to do when I joined NIH was to get a special study section for emergency medicine, and, I, and it quickly became apparent to me, after speaking to people around that it was actually a very bad, a very bad idea. So. Well, and I, I guess I'd land somewhere in the middle. My message would be, currently there are many opportunities across NIH for funding, and submit some applications. and. I, I would also echo it's really important to reach out to the program officers listed on each of the funding opportunity announcements. That specific contact knows the most about that particular funding opportunity. And it's very important to establish a relationship with them and ask them specific questions about the program or um, funding opportunity. 
Thank you. And, and, and I'm sorry, if I could just riff on that. I just want to riff on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is such, this is such an important question because everybody's looking for the magic sauce for getting funded. And, you know, we hear from lots of different communities about we need our own funding mechanism or we'd like our own institute or we'd like this or we'd like that. There are a lot of institutes out there. There's a lot of funding mechanisms out there. And to quote an unknown program director from 1930 or 35 or 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or whenever this person said this, write a good one. It's, that's the way you get funded. You don't get it because you have a special funding mechanism. You get it because you write a good one and you will need help. For those of you who are just starting out, you cannot expect to do this by yourself. You're going to need good mentors. You're going to need colleagues. You're not necessarily going to get it the first time. You need to persist. Um, but it's all doable and everybody in this room could get funded if they want to. You just need to write a well-constructed grant on an interesting project. So I, I, I got the one. microphone, so I guess I get to go first. <laughs> yeah. um, but I'm Will Moyer. I've had funding from, or currently have funding, thank you, from NINDS, NHLBI, NIDCD, Deafness and Communication Disorders, um, also the National Institute of Minority Health and Disparities, also NIA, um, and then just some friends of NIH, AHRQ, PCORI, um, so sometimes I refer to myself as, uh, <clears throat> you know, the PI acronym is, is promiscuous investigator, because um, uh, I get around. Um, so <clears throat> the thing that I think you need to realize if you're getting into research, it may be annoying in emergency medicine, right? We deal with people who have acute problems, but the NIH is a disease-specific set of institutes. So that, you, you know, it's like, well, you need to pick a disease. like, like you know, Dr. D'Onofrio was saying, you know, oh, good, you want to do informatics? Could you do that about, you know, drug addiction? And then the person got funded. So you all should familiar, familiarize yourself with the NIH's mission. The NIH's mission is to seek fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems and the application of that knowledge to enhance health, lengthen life, and reduce illness and disability. So we may have many problems in emergency medicine, but you do have to think, how directly are you improving the health of the people we are seeing both today and tomorrow? And if your research question is not directly related to that, you, you may need to move into an area where you're actually improving health. So that is just like one bit of advice I would have. It's say like, yeah, it's hard. We don't have our own institute. But plenty of the institutes have diseases that we interact with. So do something to improve the lot of patients with some disease. So Ed Michelson, Texas Tech, El Paso. <clears throat> First, thank you so much for coming. This is incredibly helpful. And I wish there were three times as many people in the room because they need to hear what you said. Um, my area of interest currently relates to COVID and long-term complications of COVID. It isn't clear to me who is now funding that research, because it could affect a number of different organ systems and outcomes. So where do I look if I want to continue specific long COVID research? I'm going to start. I think because I, I think I want to echo several points. So again, I'd like to I really appreciate you said missions. So under NIH mission, each institute have their own missions. Make sure you look at each institute mission. For example, our mission are in IID and biodefense. So if you touch the infectious disease, you touch the immunology disease, which we focus on the pathogen as well as the, uh, the host side, and then if you touch biodefense, it's us. Or you can look at NHBI. If you touch their mission, then it's theirs. Or you can have overlap. So for me, it's all about you are talking to audience. You have to think about it. We always advise our applicants, think about your audience, not think about yourself. You think you are emergency, um, emergency medicine doctor, but when you send your application to peer review panel, they look at as applicant what you want to do. They really don't care what your emergency physician or you are just the internal medical or infectious disease, right? So that I just really want to add into that. I think we probably have time for one well, more. Have, well, but the answer to your question is the NHLBI Recover Program. They are the lead institute for long COVID at the NIH. 
uh, it, you can find their own uh, website, NHLBI uh, Recover Program. They're in the middle of reorganizing some of their uh, strategy, uh, but you can look there. And then think about what end organs am I interested in looking at, and then you can also go to that institute. Specifically in this example, uh, NINDS, if you're looking at, at, at you know, neurological outcomes, but there's all kinds of okay. things. Yeah, because I'm familiar with Recover, but they have a very specific yeah, agenda, very and they want sites. They're not looking for my idea. They want me to adopt their idea yeah. as another site. So that's not quite what so, I was... So you think about, what it, for example, if you're looking at depression, let's say. So that, you have an institute behind you, right? So the, the, in, that, in, that, in that example, you know, talk to people in that, in that institute. So quickly, if you're looking at the COVID virus, you're looking at the vaccine. If you're looking at the treatment of... COVID, and including long COVID, look at our website. Talk to our program officers. Um, sorry, we might have to start setting up. Do you have a specific question for one of the program officers, potentially? I, uh, uh, my name is Craig Newgard. I'm at uh, Oregon Health and Science University. Yeah, so uh, first, thanks so much for being here. My question, if we have time for it, is... Yeah, we'll one more. Uh, um, I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts about using, using diversity supplements as a vehicle to get young people involved in research and as a research training mechanism. Um, we, at NIDA, we think it's a great um, mechanism to use and have engaged uh, numerous people through that mechanism. We do get feedback that the funding is quite limited for it, and I I personally think a K award would be better, but it is one of a number of mechanisms that can be used that are effective and helpful. I wonder what others have. Yeah, to say about um, that. for NHLBI, diversity supplements are a huge, huge uh, entry point for a lot of researchers. And I think you know, jumping to a K sometimes can be a little bit uh, challenging because if you don't have that research background, you don't have the publication history, you don't have the preliminary data, asking someone from uh, a diverse background, for example, who hasn't had that exposure with opportunities to say jump on in for, for a K, they're probably not going to be very successful. So we are very strong supporters of our diversity supplement program. I don't know how much other ICs, obviously budget is always an issue, but for NHLBI, I can tell you we set aside about $9 million for our diversity supplement program every year. So if you have a candidate, and you can tie this to you know in any of your RPG grants, um, certainly look for um, an opportunity to, to put in a supplement application. So we, you know, they, they run the gamut from high school through junior faculty, um, and you know, it's a great way to bring somebody on board, to get them kind of up to speed with the NIH and how grants work, and hopefully put in a competitive K down the road. Yeah, the same thing here for NIAID. We are highly committed to diversity supplemental support. If you have existing grants and you have a good candidate submit, we have funded a tremendous amount of that particular diversity uh, supplement request, and we have multiple resources. You can look at our, we have a website called Enhancing Diversity, including supplement, including loan repayment, including other mechanisms as well. So I'll just say ditto to all of that. We have a pretty big diversity supplement program. I will say, and I don't know if this is true at other institutes or not, a, a requirement in our diversity supplement applications is there's, there's a plan to get to some funding mechanism that's appropriate, whether it's to get to an F or to get to a K or to get to an R, depending on the level of the candidate, you know, just to be funded for a year or two with no place, no plan to get anywhere doesn't do anybody any good. So there's got to be a plan to progress in it. Thank you all so much. Sorry to rush you off. We're going to start our individual meetings in two minutes, but please come back at 4.30 for all your questions that you've thought of in the meantime, and um, we'll have a mixer right here. And if you don't mind filling out this QR code about this didactic we're collecting for the research committee. Thank you, guys.